Hi everyone, I'm Megan, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore and the host for tonight's event. This evening, we're pleased to welcome Carmen Bougon at our At Home with Literati series in support of poetry and the language of oppression, essays on politics and poetics. She will be in conversation with Serena Prabhasi. For our attendees, the chat is closed while we'll be dropping links to purchase poetry in the language of oppression from Literati throughout the event. You can also use the Q&A feature in your toolbar to submit questions at any time. A reminder that you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup and shipping to your home anywhere in the United States. Um, and now allow me to introduce tonight's author and moderator. Carmen Bougon, George Orwell Prize Fellow, is the author of four poetry collections, most recently Lilies from America, New and Selected Poems, a memoir, Burying the Typewriter, Children Under the Eye of a Secret Police, and a monograph on Shane Moschini and East European Poetry and Translation, Poetics of Exile. She was a 2018 Helen DeVoy Professor in Honors at the University of Michigan and taught in the Continuing Education Department at the University of Oxford, while she was a Creative Arts Fellow in Literature at Wolfson College. Um, she has a doctorate in English Literature from Beloit uh, College, Oxford. She currently teaches at the Gotham Writers Workshop in Manhattan. Serena Prabhasi is the author of The Coffee House Resistance, Brewing Hope in Desperate Times, and co-founder of Boonie Coffee. She was born in the Netherlands, raised in India, China, and Nepal, and spent formative years in the United States and Ethiopia. Following a career leading initiatives in global health, education, water, and sanitation, Serena moved with her husband Elias from Addis Ababa to New York City, where they started Booney Coffee together. Today, Booney is a thriving business and a hub for community conversation and action. On Twitter, she's at S. Prabhasi. Um, a small note, Carbon's computer may have technical issues. Uh, if she disappears, please stick around and she will be right back. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carmen and Serena. Thank you everyone for joining me for the launch of poetry and the language of oppression here in the States. I'm very grateful to have my book supported by the wonderful staff at Literati Bookstore in Ann Arbor. So thank you for this introduction and for welcoming me and Sarina here. Um, Ann Arbor is the town of the great University of Michigan where I was an undergraduate student nearly three decades ago. And um, where I delivered the lectures that eventually became this book. Um, I was there in 2018 um, as the Helen DeRoy Professor in Honors. I also wish to express my gratitude to Oxford University Press. I know it's um, one o'clock in the morning there, but thank you for anyone who's, uh, who's listening for publishing this book. I would not have had the celebration today without my amazing editors uh, there. Tonight, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined from New York City um, by Sarina Prabasi, the author of the Coffee House Resistance, Brewing Hope in Desperate Times. She and I will talk about coffee culture, books, and activism, things very familiar to the Ann Arbor community. But we will have our own stories to tell about coffee and books and activism. So, um, I'd like to introduce the book a little bit to say uh, a few words about the book, and here it is. But before I do anything um, about the prose, I'd like to start with the poem, because the book is about poetry, is the consideration of poetry. So I'd like to read um, the poem, The Names of Things, as an introduction to tonight's talk. Sunlight in a water bowl on the doorstep, then on a pond far from home, Swarele. Fire in the terracotta hearth, then in a pit outside a tent, thousands of miles away, Fokul. My black sea lolling the shore, then dreams of sea, waking cheeks with stinging salt. Mara, air encircling the grapes outside the window, then gliding with a parachute above a heron. Ayrul, soil exhaling after rain through gaps between cherry leaves, then crying dirty tears from roots of a fallen birch. 
Pamantua. With this, I'd like to position myself as a um, writer in a non-native language, um, a poet um, between languages, as it were, because it's important, um, is an important aspect of how I position myself in, in, in relation to poetry and to literature in general, um, and also to language. The essays in poetry and the language of oppression constitute a meditation on the language of poetry, contributing the specific context of our political times when poetry and politics clash and leave marks on each other as specific languages within language. Sort of like the egg, uh, the, the egg that has, you know, the yolk inside the egg. I'm talking about this in a book. This language is within language. I suppose the book returns to the ancient quarrel between poetry's pleasure and the usefulness to civic society and human life. In my view, which of course is not new or pioneering, poetry as any other form of literature cannot be separated from the effect it creates both on the writer and on the audience. And therefore it cannot be assessed as being divorced from were disinterested in civic society or personal life, even if one argues that the only thing it provides is some form of aesthetic pleasure. Literary pleasure itself is a concept that involves an interaction and communication with others. I believe that the way we express ourselves through language is a manifestation of who we are, the life of our minds, is in the language we speak. And the language we speak is the language we learn from others and through experience. So everything is interlinked. The five essays in my book on the nature of the lyric eye, on sounding the deeps of nature, on resettling in the English language, on artistic distance and writing in turbulent times, show my own view of uh, the role of poetry in, in our lives. Um, I make the argument that poetry cannot be separated from a sense of morality. And I do this using my personal experience of growing up under an oppressive political regime and finding a source of resistance and healing in poetry. In this sense, the book is a deeply personal story of writing. Speaking from my experience as a person, as a citizen, a reader, and a writer, I discuss poetry in civic society and in personal life. For example, poetry can make a testimony about being a persecuted child of political dissidents, but this cannot constitute a legal testimony for poetry is concerned with painting the large canvas of human suffering rather than calling a particular oppressor to the courtroom. Poetry can engage in resistance, but it is not a political manifesto or a set of easily digestible banners that can create undesired public emotions. Poetry can be deeply political, but it does not declare temporal and specific political affiliations. So one cannot vote on a poet's partisanship. Poetry contains clarity of perception and imagery, but it is deeply suggestive. It can be printed as a final text, but it changes character and grows with each subsequent reading. The point I make is that like water, language and literature in particular, can be both life-giving and dangerous. And it takes its character from the places and the people it courses through. Like water, literature should be valued and respected for what it represents. And it represents many things and many things to many people and many people at different times in history. I argue that poetry is the soul in paraphrase to borrow a quote from George Herbert's poem, Prayer One, 
where he defines the language of a prayer. Poetry to me provides a space for deeper reflection about our experience in a world. And in this way, placing itself in a participatory relationship with the life of our minds and hearts, not side by side with the life of our minds and hearts. So this is the right place to bring in Sarina and begin our conversation about books and coffee culture and activism. And Sarina, to start on a more specific idea here, I want to use a quote from A Prayer for My Daughter written by uh, the poet W.B. Yeats to express, uh, and, and he wrote this poem to express what he wished his daughter would become and what kind of blessings he wanted her to enjoy in her life. It's a very complex poem, but there are two lines here which interest me a lot. How but in custom and in ceremony are innocence and beauty born? So I want to take this phrase from you to sort of bring it to our times and, and bring it to our, our own experience. And can you talk a little bit about your background as an activist, as a businesswoman, as a writer, in terms of the custom and ceremony of coffee making and coffee drinking, which are such a big part of your private and public life. And then maybe we can, we can take the conversation from there. Thank you, Carmen. I mean, I have to first say that I'm so honored to be here with you today. And for the audience members who may not know, I met Carmen initially uh, as my teacher, and she continues to be a very generous and um, full-hearted teacher. And I really say that I don't think my own book would exist in the form that it does had I not taken her class. So um, really it's a big, big honor for me to be uh, here today. I love those lines, uh, custom and ceremony. A lot of what, um, I have spent the last uh, maybe decade of my life uh, with the coffee company and looking at coffee culture is around custom and ceremony. Um, when my husband and I, as Carmen mentioned, moved from Addis Ababa, and Megan said in her introduction, we moved from Addis Ababa to New York City now exactly 10 years ago. And when we moved, we really had this idea of the Ethiopian ceremony and customs around coffee and hospitality and what coffee meant for that country because it's a huge um, source of livelihood but also spirituality of community connection and in fact also of resistance because a lot of the conversations that happen uh, in the coffee ceremony are conversations that you would not have elsewhere. Uh, often these ceremonies are held outdoors in the backyard or in the front porch or in places where you may feel safer in discussing things that you may not want uh, people to um, deliberately or accidentally overhear. So it's interesting, there is that, that sense of, uh, and then of course in, in Western uh, coffee culture as well and in Western civilization, the cafes and the, the beginnings of cafes as places that were really um, challenging, you know, for people. They were places where um, radical ideas could be discussed and where there was this fear of, of not, not only the, the coffee, the, the new drink itself, but also of what it was, what it was fomenting, what was happening in these cafes and through a lot of times through art through literature, through poetry, through song, this irreverence that there, there was this, this challenging of whatever the, the ruling ideas and regimes of the time may have been. So it's an interesting, um, just an interesting connection between this idea of the arts and, and poetry and the larger sort of systems and structures that govern us and, and oppression and that the languages, the two languages and how they interact with each other. Yeah, so, I mean, 
the when I conceived the idea of this book as you know uh, poetry and the language of oppression, I was looking at poetry as a form of resistance uh, to oppression and and how that happened in my own life. And I was hoping that by giving the story of my life, I would bring out this idea that um, there is a force in poetry out there that it's not available to us um, in other ways. That's because the poetry as an art is a softer language, is, is a beckoning language in a lot of ways but it's the language that also makes us think a bit deeper. So um, I, I talk about the, the, the life experience and the interaction in, in my life uh, between, there's a triangle there, right? Between the, the government oppression, I grew up under uh, the communist regime of Romania. My father was a political dissident and he was imprisoned for protesting with words. And this is where my fascination came from, you know, typing um, uh, protest uh, pamphlets at a buried typewriter. And, you know, and then he was, um, he was imprisoned for that. And then we were put under surveillance as a family. So there was the, the oppression, the straightforward oppression of, of the communist regime there, but then the direct oppression of our family because my father resisted with words and with the typewriter. And then as a result of that, then the second a part of the triangle was suppression, which was a need for self-censorship to which you alluded there, you know, you have the copy outside, um, not inside. Um, so um, because you don't want the walls to have years. And I grew up with, with, with the, you know, when I talk about the power of language, the first thing that comes to mind is wall, walls have years. That sense of being monitored, that sense of being, um, you know, uh, supervised. And, and, uh, and because of that, there's a level of self-censorship that happens. And, and so how do you deal with these two things that sort of come head to head in your life? You know, you, you, you are pushed from the outside and then you, you stop talking, you stop being who you are. I mean, that's your sense of identity um, changes. You, you become a silent person. You're no longer a person who grows and experiences the world and is, is uh, you know, expressive about it. And then poetry came as this expressive category of, of, of existence, I suppose, in my life when um, I was writing poems to, to the pictures of my father expressing the need to, to see him or just the feelings that I was missing him. Um, so little by little over the years, and then as I was learning, um, English, the English language, that why I start, that's why I started the talk with the names of things. Um, English has actually given me a way of, again, of speaking without having that sense of being heard by, by, by these hostile listeners, by, by these secret police and by the informers, even though it was quite childish when I first started. Um, writing in English, obviously people do speak English, uh, people who spy and they want to spy overseas. And so um, the point of the book here is how, how does that interaction is asking, how does that interaction happen in other contexts of oppression? For example, family abuse or um, different kinds of government abuse. Now we're dealing with crises all over the world. Um, we're dealing with Afghanistan, we're dealing with a coronavirus pandemic, which is a different sense of, um, of oppression and, and, and suppression of the self and, and trying to express ourselves. Um, and, I, and I came up with this idea that, you know, you, one can write oneself free. So that's mm -hmm. the, the, the way I thought that there is an interaction between poetry and life. How can I write myself free and how can I show the mechanism of that? Um, to talk about the the, the resistance, the, the notion of resistance in, in literature. There is also something so powerful in, um, as you were saying, the, the writing that you started doing as a child. And um, also in your memoir, 
uh, Bearing the Typewriter, which if, if people haven't read that, definitely highly recommend uh, you, you get a copy. That was so powerful in there too, was the child voice. The, the, the systems of oppression and this sort of all powerful um, regimes versus the child's voice. And there was also so much power in that child's voice um, as you were writing in that, I thought that was really striking too, in terms of just those two, um, the juxtaposition there. Yeah. And then patriarchy, I mean, also I was thinking when you were talking earlier about the different types of oppression, um, so much of, even, even in when I was writing in my book, a lot of the growing up in Nepal and, and the, even the coffee culture in Ethiopia, there was this, um, this thing with the, like the wall almost of patriarchy and writing, writing, uh, against that or around that or through that somehow as well. In fact, tell me a bit about the experience of being able to voice all of those complexities in your book, The Coffee House Resistance. And then I want to ask you a bit about your uh, sort of activism in your coffee house about writing letters and, 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 and getting people together in your neighborhood. Um, but how was it when, when you wrote, did you, uh, because it was a memoir, um, it's a memoir, The Coffee House Resistance, and you are talking about um, complex issues there, you know, different cultures that clash, uh, different perceptions of America when you move here, the, the whole notion of patriarchy. Did you at some point feel uncomfortable about bringing some of those things up, or did you feel sort of that the register of the language itself, sort of the lyricism of the language helped you sort of soften what you were saying to the point that you could say it, but it wouldn't come out as confrontational. Yeah, no, there was definitely discomfort in, in the fact that, you know, what, on the one hand, I was writing, uh, you know, a, a, tr a traditional memoir, a, a, the story of my life. On the other hand, I was also writing a very political story. And as it unfolded, I think I also among readers, you know, there was a bit of surprise to say, oh, I didn't know this was going to end up here. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, maybe this would just be about these different cultures and customs and starting a business. But, oh, it's political, you know, and I, I think I had to make a, a deliberate decision to say um, that might not be traditional. That might not be the traditional sort of path of, but but that is that is what the story is going to be about. So that it it it, but it there is tension there, right? There's definitely tension between literature that is very literary and lyrical and um, writing that is overtly political, and yeah, and so there there is a discomfort there. There is definitely a discomfort there, isn't it? I'm having, so, you know, one of my, um, I suppose the creative dilemmas that I have and that I talk about in this book, Poetry and the Language of Oppression is, at what point does something begin to be political and cease to be lyrical? And how much, how can you really, also on the other hand, how can you really separate what you are saying from the impact it has on the audience? So therefore, isn't it political anyway, even if you just say that, all right, this is a lyrical expression. Um, it, it, it does depend, I mean, of course, politics uh, and political situations, you know, let's say we, we both lived through, <laughs> through Trump and, um, and the nightmare of, uh, of, of those years, it was impossible to distance ourselves emotionally. And therefore, because emotions are the primary uh, father of poetry, right? I mean, you know, poets write about their emotions is, is that that's the life of the poem. Um, it was difficult not to be disturbed and not to engage with that at a personal level as much as one liked to, to put it aside and say, this is not part of the aesthetic realm of my profession. I will not deal with this, you know? Um, so I dealt a lot with, with those questions and I struggled over sort of both extremes on how does one do it? And then in my poetry as well, you know, I have poems 
uh, for example, I have the poem um, that um, engages directly with um, storming of the Capitol building mm -hmm. um, and uh, with, the, with the police shootings during the um, uh, protests here. And, and I had to ask myself, how, how, how much weight can you put on a lyric language, but what betrayal would it be not to put those inside the lyric language because we all feel and mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to acknowledge those feelings in it, as opposed to simply retreating. I'm, I'm also making the argument that, you know, it's no longer tenable to retreat in our own little worlds and say, we're just making jewels of sound and we're just writing nature poetry because that very nature is being threatened by things like politics, like climate change and other, th change and other things. So nothing really is divorced. <laughs> from language and, and from expression. Um, but you started to say, you know, about some of the current events that you have been engaging with in your writing, but say a little bit more about, you know, this, this idea, this language of oppression and then its counterpoint, the language of resistance and how you see that now in sort of the current events and everything that's happening around us, which is, you know, can be so overwhelming and so much. But I, yeah, say a little bit more about how you see that interplay. Yeah, so let me start first with, um, with this idea, with, with sort of my definition of what the language of oppression is from my personal experience, and then I'll move on to, to something. So, in the book, I, I make specifically, one cannot be too general about the language of oppression, where else it becomes meaningless. The whole point is, you know, how can you claim knowledge of something um, so big? I mean, anything can be a language of oppression. So if you're talking about political slogans, if you're talking about any kind of indoctrination, um, if you're talking about marketing and product marketing and, and getting you to, to believe that you could not be something unless you have that specific material thing. All of these are part of oppression. The, the, the sense that you know there is a structure of thinking that is imposed on you and you cannot function outside it. And once you feel powerless, then you, 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 you feel like you have no choice and no agency in your life. And that's you know a huge part of why, you know, of, of the mechanism of oppression. But what I talk about in my book and the definition that I give, which is quite specific, is really um, the surveillance during the Cold War um, in Eastern Europe. And I talk a lot about reading the secret police files on my family, um, uh, uh, letters that, that were censored that we sent to my father to prison. I talk about um, transcripts of, of our conversations around the house and our phone conversations. And I give um, examples of, I've translated some of those documents and show how actually technical and how professionalized that surveillance, that language um, and how bureaucratic that language was. That is to, I wanted to set the extreme that, you know, if you start from there, how does poetry interact with that and how does poetry respond to that? And I wanted to read a poem actually because that's the best way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a poem about my reaction to the files um, and to the language of the files itself. And then I'll talk a little bit more about what you were asking me or what about now? How, how do we deal with it now? So, um, I suppose that the, what I need to say about this poem, this is a birthday letter and is based on the transcripts. Um, um, of a visit that I made to my father um, in, in, in prison. And so why am I talking about this poem? Because I believe that history and oppression happen in the minutia of our lives and that poetry can make them emotionally intelligible. This is where the poetry comes in when I was talking about painting the canvas of human suffering. 
But for me as a writer, um, it was a, the process of writing that was very healing. I enjoyed the moments of concentration that I had to write the poem and to come up with the images. And I felt better about the whole situation, about talking about it even, um, about voicing this. So here it is. Um, the idea of the custom of the cer ceremony comes in here in a sense that once you put shape to the experience and you put it into a certain, um, the shape of the poem, it has a particular place like a cup of coffee or like, like a loaf of bread that is something that you can offer and say, this is a bit of understanding. This is what I'm getting at with this custom and ceremony. And mm. you do it in a way that is understood. We can negotiate with each other through poetry, yeah? We can use the custom of poetry sharing in order to talk about difficult things. That was my argument um, in the book. A birthday letter. The words the source informs you echo in my head that other voice, familiar, comfortable almost, lining our private cries. The inmate wrote to his wife and children from the Ayud prison. Our letters journeyed through the clay-like maze of secret police desks. Stamps, checks, dates, signatures indicate officers and places. The paraphrase of ongoing pain. Half the time they paraphrase us. That voice and introduction sticks to our words like a skin disease impossible to cure. But then, some sentences from us burst free, perhaps because they're not translatable, editable, condensable. They stand out in quotation marks, unexpected missing heartbeats. On 4 May 1985, my father thought about his birthday. Make a cake with 50 candles and take a picture. I recall the cake on our kitchen table and thinking about him in chains that day. My dear, the children are healthy, mother said. Come to see me with my children, he said. Do you remember me coming home with snow on my brow? A letter says, children, I so much miss you. I kiss you all and your mother and me. How beautiful it would have been for you to have been here too. Sell everything you can, he urged. Send the children to school. Do not despair. I might be coming home soon. We hung onto those few words that would cross the clay-like murky territories between us. These letters were like skin that covered and protected our bodies from the cold outside. Each word the capillary that carried and supported the life in each one of us. Each word was limitless, clothed our souls and warmed against despair, shielded us from their world of terror, transported chills, shivers, anger, warmth from us to father and back from him to us. They took us to each other as we were. When the censor took our words and talked about them, discarded our handwriting and wrote his, he became a flaying instrument. Letters we sent were not received until now, 30 years on. We, Marcias the satyr tied to our tree. The censor scraped at capillaries of our words. What survives is howling. A year has passed with no news from you. Something awful is happening to you. No one looks after us anymore. They're all busy. Mother is ill and short-tempered. Even grandmother has left. It's disgraceful that you have nothing to eat. 30 years have passed and we have lived with exposed wounds, doubts, fears, uncertainties. Now I find the family letters from back then in the midst of thousands of records. I reconstruct the way we used to speak, the way skin used to feel when it was still alive, denatured letters in the handwriting of the censor. I make out capillaries under the flaying instrument. I reconstruct parts of the skin from the words that were copied out. 
we now know what has been taken from us and how words alone saved us then and bring joy now, the joy of finding them. For in their frail syllables, I recognize the old self. Apollo has cleaned his instrument and left. So I suppose here what I bring about is something that, you know, might as well apply to many, many things today is what is the power of government over people? How can you have access to something as intimate as this? And how does the poet answer um, to this state of, to state of affairs when, you know, so somebody where a list of people will, will insert themselves into family life. And then, you know, now anywhere in the world you could look at, you could have instances where you have either that kind of surveillance or that kind of intimidation. But it's a kind of intimidation and surveillance could also play out in domestic abuse where things don't get through to the people you need to get things through and where the language itself, and this is what I'm saying in a book, is a manifestation of the reality, is the language itself becomes denatured because of the words that we put in them, the words that are debasing and the words that are you know, hurting people. Um, it's those poems that I wrote in, in, in releasing the porcelain birds, which was uh, uh, one of my collections um, about specifically with the rec records were very difficult to, to write because I, I put them side by side. And then also sort of taking this extreme view of, you know, what is the language of oppression and how do I define it by going directly there and focusing that definition on, on this um, surveillance um, what was to the, to the purpose of, of showing that there is such a thing as having too much intervention, too much power um, of one person over another. And, and that needs to be acknowledged for the damage it causes. So, you know, it's, I'm not here to sort of say, you know, um, uh, you know, be against communism, but I'm here to say it's it's a cry against suffering. Um, what happens in a current situation? I suppose the most recent uh, the most recent situation with the pandemic required a different answer to this public trauma, and um, I suppose I could. Um, I suppose I could read um, a, a poem that deals with uh, with the pandemic in order to to sort of offer that um, um, different response. I suppose that poetry can can give this time to to a medical nightmare, but the medical nightmare that has affected uh, countries and families. Mm -hmm. So the the poem is called For the Time Being. And by the way, the uh, book of poems that I published, that I, sorry, that I wrote during the pandemic, um, year and a half, will, will be published. I just had words uh, today from my publisher in England that will come out with Shear, Shearsman Books um, next uh, spring. So I'm delighted to say that, you know, my, um, my witnessing of the coronavirus pandemic is, uh, is uh, going to be published. I'm, I'm delighted with that. But here is the poem from where the collection takes its title for the time being. We are fine, they say, for the time being. Enough food in a pantry, the prescriptions filled. No need to go out of the house except to let the dog run in a yard. Our road has fallen silent. We can hear the trees near the river. It feels like a long Sunday, but without the church. There is plenty of time to watch the trees bloom. What was the last time? The elderly are used to sitting the days. 
but we are also fine, the younger ones, for the time being. We have time to play with our children, bake, wash the curtains. Now that the shelves at the shops are empty and the parking lots are drive through testing labs, we have time to pray for those who are dying in the hospitals. We pray the nurses will stay healthy through extended working shifts. We pray the doctors get a good night's sleep before they fight to grip life slipping through their hands for the time being. In other countries, many sing from their balconies to cheer each other up through so much dying. We call, check in, reassure and smile from a distance, hoping for the time being. So I suppose with this poem was the um, effort to bring about some sense of hope while acknowledging that we were at the beginning of the pandemic in, in that situation where everything was still and we didn't know what the storm was going to look like. Um, now that we are at the end of that and you know we're, we're facing the God knows what the uncertainty of, of, of the Delta um, and in the return to school of the children in, you know, in a situation that is far less than ideal. Um, that there is that sense in me, the poet in me, so that thinking of that intervention again, of that participating with, um, I suppose the most I can do is words of consolation um, and uh, sort of urging people to you know, stay calm and keep fighting. Um, is there a specific message a poet can send? I've, I mean, I've been dealing with this. You, you asked me, what, what, what do you do about now? How, how is it now? You've articulated what you've been through before. How do we participate now with, with poetry? I'm dealing with that every single day, every single day. In, now I'm thinking about Afghanistan. What, what is the right word to say in poetry? And how can, I, how can I do it that I know you will reach people and it will bring about some good change? And do I, do I even understand what good change is as a citizen, let alone a poet who is called to uh, the responsibility to articulate something um, other than just the private you know, dismay or anger of this, which is somehow too little you know, for it. It's, there's a lot of thinking going on. And I suppose I'm not the only one, you know, like how do you, what do you start with poetry? Do, do you look back at the poems that, that inspired us before to be stronger than we thought we could be, or that, than we knew we could be, where, you know, do we, do we find new forms? It's another thing that I'm talking about. Is there, is there a new form that somehow will be able to meet suffering face to face. And, you know, could I contribute that form in some way? Very, very, very big questions that come up because the world is in such a, an upheaval. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier also about just the idea of bearing witness, right? As, as, as the poet, as a chronicler, as somebody who uses words, to bear witness to what the, the times we are living through. And like, especially in this pandemic uh, collection, I mean, congratulations, Carmen, on the good news about the collection, but, but, but you have written through the pandemic, right? And, and we're still in it and it's not over, but, but uh, even just thinking about those early days, it, it feels like we, we were, in a very different place, in a very different uh, experiencing all of these things for the first time for most of us. Tell me a bit, just, just, it just occurred to me right now, with the coffee. Yes. How was it seeing people, you know, because there was a lockdown, right, when you couldn't offer anything, but when you started offering coffee again, how was it to see people again and hand them that cup of coffee and, and have those first words? Tell me about it. I mean, it was really, uh, I would say it brought a lot of joy. We could also see like viscerally just how much trauma people had experienced, you know? So it was quite emotional actually in that small 
gesture, right? In that small exchange of, but also in all the ways that during the pandemic we had sort of twisted and turned and you know brought people brought coffee to people's doorsteps rather than instead of people coming to the coffee shop but that simple act of going and getting your morning coffee at, at your regular place uh and that feeling of return right like it's a so many people said to me it's it's like the first bit of normalcy like so it's the first normal thing. It's the first place I've gone indoors. It's the first place I've come in, even with my mask on. You know, it's the first. It's like the first step uh, in that that conversation. Um, so yeah, definitely. And we see, in a way, we also. I feel like a lot of people that are in the service industries, in food and beverage and hospitality, are in a way the in the front lines. We're we're also bearing witness to uh, the effects of, of this year and a half on people and how much people have um, suffered in their own ways, you know, through loneliness or through loss or through, through the loss of, you know, having to make difficult decisions about careers and children and all of that too. Uh, so the, of course, the, the disease and loss and grief but also uh, huge disruptions in people's lives uh, where they have moved or left or just have such different arrangements than they did before. But again, like coming back to that custom, that, that little exchange of getting the morning coffee or the afternoon coffee um, has a sense of comfort, I guess. Mm, yeah, that, that sort of return to, I suppose, to the custom and ceremony, isn't it? Yeah. That sense that normality being the custom of ceremonies, that there's something between us that we share, whether that is with an essential worker. I mean, my sister is a nurse, my and, and her husband um, is a nurse as well, the, you know, University of Michigan Hospital. So they have seen their share of, you know, uh, illness and, and, and you know, uh, pain uh, on their side. And then they've had to make decisions about their two girls, you know, whether how they're schooled and how my sister works and all this. Um, and there is a, I mean, the, the role of language in all this cannot be, you know, overstated with, with the messaging that we've gone to, to the messaging that we're receiving now with the, with the reassurance that we're getting. And all of these, I think all of these, all these words go deeply within us, you know, it's, it's over now. Everybody uses the word recovery now. So I've been writing about recovery quite because the book has followed a journal. These poems in the time being in the book are all dated. I had this compulsion, this instinctual compulsion to date everything. And I don't know why, maybe subconsciously I thought maybe something will happen. Mm. And I will know when something happened when when the story ended in a sense. I mean, it, it, was, it was such an anxious time, even though we were safe inside a house, but that, you know, that dread to go out and to meet people and to hug people, you know? So I, I dated everything. This is why time has become so important in, in, in my mind anyway. And I think, but also in, in terms of language, there's a sense of temporality in language that now, we will forever, re, you know, uh, refer to this as the the time of the pandemic, the year of the pandemic, where the two years of you know pause or disaster, however we're going to name it. Um, so I I am very eagerly also um, reading and looking at how other people, how other poets have taken in the pandemic and turned that experience into, I suppose this will be a language um, of witnessing it. And then later on, it would be part of the language of recovery. We don't see it now. We just see the stories of this happened, this happened, this happened, because we write as we live. But I imagine 20, 30 years from now, we'll be looking back at the screams of pain that are in those poems. And we'll be looking back at the despair, but also you know, the, the gesture of hope and all this what the language will carry us through. I believe the language will carry us through. And I believe we will carry ourselves through the language. 
as well um, in some way. I wanted to just ask, I, I know uh, right now there aren't any questions in the Q&A, but if anybody did have any questions, this would be a great time to just put it in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, Carmen and I could just go on talking <laughs> and chatting away. We have about uh, three minutes at most. Um, so yeah, if we, if we see any questions um, coming up into the message here, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take them. Yeah. Um, in, in, and in the meantime, I wanted to ask you from um, Sarina about this activism, this, uh, you know, have you returned to the gatherings in a neighborhood? I know that at some point you, you, you had people come in and play games and, and sign postcards to politicians and, and talk about the life in your neighborhood in there. Are you returning a bit to that? Um, not, not in terms of physical gatherings, just beginning, I would say just beginning. We, we actually, our last event that we had was an art opening and the artist, um, had painted throughout the pandemic pictures of people's homes. So because everybody was spending so much time at home, so it was somebody's kitchen, somebody's living room, somebody's favorite chair that they read in, you know, all these, what we have surrounded ourselves with, the interior landscape of our homes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, a, a art show and the, the, it's called Home. He's an Ethiopian artist. And uh, so we did have people come for that and it was so wonderful to, you know, everybody masked and everything, but still to be able to gather again and, um, one of the difficulties of for us um, in a you know as a business was that a, so much of our identity is about being a gathering place. So if we couldn't be a gathering place, then then what were we? Uh, and we found different ways to answer that question. But it is really um, it has been wonderful to start seeing people again in person, and slowly we'll start with um other activism but yeah we at, at one time we were very very active in a lot of political but also policy issues like health care and climate change and uh others i see there's a question i think now um so this is orvi asking how do you remain hopeful as an artist in the face of unrelenting oppression so I mean, f for speaking for myself as a writer in as as a civic being, I suppose as a citizen, um, is there a choice? Is there another choice? I don't know if there is another choice. I I think we have. I have two children. I mean, there's no way I couldn't be hopeful. The question is, how do we define that hope? how we have to be remarkably clear about the shape of that hope and about the words that we could put that hope in order to mean something to others. Um, every day I wake up and I think maybe, um, uh, maybe I could put a good word out there. That's the way I know how to do it, you know, starting with my kids and then, you know, um, trying to write again, trying to write the consciousness of our times in the best way I can. Um, and, um, and not really not give up. I mean, I've, I've always refused giving up on anything really. Um, ha having recognized how oppression works and how specifically how suppression works, how you can make yourself feel hopeless. I suppose there is, um, that is the return to language as a source and as a resource. And that's how I stay hopeful. Um, There's one other question, I'll read it to you. Um, Carmen and Serena, thanks so much for illuminating reflections. Carmen, to return to the political dimension, what happens when the language of resistance to oppression hardens into a language of oppression by some diabolical reversal? Yes, so I talk about this. It's very important. Um, it's a skill. I suppose that 
the language, I mean, it's a fa I, I make the argument very clearly in my book, it's a failure of art to incite hatred in response to oppression and to and and to become narrow minded i mean it's a, it's a fa it's an artistic failure first of all for those who are interested in the aesthetics and the ethics aspect of of writing um how okay, so there has to be in check one cannot be uh, avoiding moral superiority and moral high standing um and 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 writing as a process of self-reflection, I suppose, right? Because when you write, you have to think about what you put out there for others. Um, and knowing that one participates with every word one puts out there as a writer, because obviously we do have the, the chance to edit the writing and to publish the writing and it goes to several editors. It's not as um, impulsive as me saying now something on Zoom that I might regret 10 minutes from now or for the rest of my life. But it's, you know, it's, it's saying things that will be published and it will be considered before. So I talk a lot about the responsibility towards published writing. One really needs to consider the parameters under which um, published writing should be judged. Um, and, you know, being judgmental also should be, uh, th there is a sense, well, there's a common sense, as we say in Romania, you know, you just, if you just use your common sense. Um, then you avoid a lot of the pitfalls. But this does happen a lot, that you have people resisting oppression and then they become so um, aggressive in their own ways that they put everybody up. And so um, moderation um, and, and the sense, I think just simply the respect for the fact that language, like I was saying at the beginning, they are there clearly in front of your face, but they're endlessly suggestive. And you know, they, the interpretation of, of, of a poem or of an essay or of a story um, changes on each subsequent reader with one reader and changes with the reader. So one really um, has to be very careful, especially in these days when we are rethinking um, the sources of our culture. We are now strongly and severely rethinking what do we get our ideas from and who are our cultural forefathers and foremothers and you know there's the, the all this conversation about you know decolonizing the calendar and doing this and that and this and that and so this is a time where um respect for language will yield a lot of illumination i suppose and you know responsibility on how we use it i mean the concept of responsibility towards the published word this is what I would say. Um, oh, so yeah. it looks like we've reached the, uh, the top of the hour, but thank you so much to Carmen and Serena for joining us um, on At Home with Literati, a reminder to buy Poetry in the Language of Oppression. The link is in the chat. Um, and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And it's lovely to see you again, Serena. It's wonderful. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Megan. Bye. <laughs>